gone down similar routes of, of kind of detailing it to that degree, I guess would be people like J.K. Rowling, who again is notorious, she spent you know, years creating her little universe before she actually really started detailing the plots. And for some authors, you, you've almost, I think it's, it's, it can become an addiction or a danger that you spend all the time in creating your little planet and not actually the time in, into doing the writing for it. And I think some of the points that Ricardo made were, were very well made in that when, you, when you're putting that much detail in it, it's very easy to make uh, errors as a writer such that you will start, uh, you know, detailing the kind of the pipe smoking rituals, five pages of that, just because you've actually done the research on it. Uh, and I think where the, the really sort of good writers differ from the very bad writers is that they will kind of wear their research very lightly on their sleeves and you, you get the feel of the depth. You know it's there, but you don't actually have to read sort of seven pages of, you know, religious detail or, you know, cultural detail that has just basically been dropped in as an information dump. You'll, you'll just, you know, get the feel of the depth from, from the, uh, the work itself. And I think that's one of, the, one of the, the, the things you have to do as an author is make those kind of judgment calls about how, how much you want to push the detail into people's faces and how much you want to wear it lightly on, on your sleeves. Um, and like I say, talking obviously has a, an enormous amount of detail and I think that's what, what's always attracted and kept fans in that world. And J.K. Rowling also. In science fiction I can really only think of something like Dune of a sort of similar amount of, of depth. I think you can probably tell the novels where that amount of depth has been put into the work. Um, you'll, you'll probably find that the editors will make you put a glossary in the back of, back of the book. And indeed a lot of people have said to me, oh, I would have really benefited if you put a glossary in, in the back of your book, Stephen, of books. But um, for me personally, I, I didn't actually have to do that much research into my books because although I think a lot of people think perhaps that I've just created all this stuff, in reality, I haven't. It, it was actually there in history. So, for instance, I have things like a, um, a, a vacuum-based transport system under the, the capital of my kingdom, called, uh, which is called Middlesteel, the, the actual capital city. Uh, and the transport system is called the at atmospheric, and it's basically vacuum, vacuumless tubes that just suck these capsules along, almost like the metro system today. And there was actually a working prototype for that in Victorian times, which was never actually put into full production. They did, a, they did build one specifically for the post office in the 19th century. So all the mail was basically being sent by these little uh, capsules under the ground, but not human passengers. And lots of people say, well, that's a really good invention, Stephen. But actually, I, I didn't invent that. The Victorians invented it. I just read about it in a history book. Uh, and because I was very familiar with the, the history of the period, it wasn't exactly as if I was having to sit down and discover you know, how those kind of things work in detail. I know um, a lot of the, the popular works in England tend to be around uh, you know, the sort of Napoleonic Wars and the history of the time, and particularly the boats. So you get things like uh, Master and Commander, which of course was made into a film, and they go into great amounts of detail in how a Napoleonic ship is rigged. And you've got uh, that actually being reflected in popular fantasy now with Naomi Novak's Tamier sort of dragon series, which is basically the Napoleonic Wars being refought in a world where sort of dragon. Uh, the Dragon uh, Air Force exists, and that, that again, there, there's a huge amount of inventive detail there in, in how the, the ships work and how the dragon, the dragons are rigged and that kind of thing. But you know, th those are the kind of details you can find in history, really, to a large degree. The, the boats, anyway, not the dragons, obviously. Um, so, I, I, like I say, I, I've discovered most of my stuff in history, uh, and indeed a lot of the terms which I, I was having a, a conversation with uh, Safa who is one of the, the sort of editorial staff at Emergency Exit, who, who are the publisher for the book that's coming out. And she was saying how much trouble the, uh, the translator had had with my book and the terms in it. But a lot of the terms were actually historical terms. They, they weren't terms that I, I'd made up. I would, I would totally agree with, with Ricardo on the kind of point of, that there's, not a, there's not a great degree of benefit in inventing a you know, a, a new time-based system or new measurement. And I think it can feel very hollow as an author if you're sort of saying, oh, you know, rather than they, they went 20 leagues, or they, they went 20 yogos or something, and it took me 20, 20 21 yarns to get there, and that kind of thing, and have you invented days? I mean, that, that kind of thing can be really great. So, so most of my detail did actually come out of, you know, real history. 
So for instance, some of the slang at the time, um, I, I used the word toppers for assassins. And that's actually, in Victorian times, if you wanted to assassinate somebody, you would hire a topper. Uh, because there's the, the sort of slang in England, to, to top somebody is basically to, to have them murdered or executed. So that though, for me, that all those things came out of, out of you know, the real history of things. Um, I, I, I did have a sort of geography which was, was fairly fictional. Uh, one thing I should say about my book, or books, is that they're actually set in the far future. So my idea was that uh, you'd have this planet, which would basically be Earth, but um, reformed, if you like, both through sort of extensive terraforming at various points in its history, and also um, through geo you know, geological drift. So things aren't exactly where you'd expect them to be, just in the same way as if you went back a few million years, you'd have a single landmass. Um, so I, I think people were... I, I never really was that, that explicit uh, a lot of people, I think, read my book and they thought it was something called steampunk, or I believe the term is vapour punk in a place like Brazil, which is really a kind of that, that Victorian idea taken into, into literary form. But for me, my books really were fantasy with a Victorian setting rather than being pure steampunk. And the reason for that is that, um, well, like I say, I, I knew the period very well, but... but um, if you look at what I would class as proper steampunk, it is actually a proper pseudo-Victorian setting, normally with, with a historical reason for why they have high technology. So some of the steampunk works that have done very well in the UK, they, they've kind of had things like the, uh, the invasion from Mars in HG Wells actually really did happen. And when, when they were beaten, the Victorians got, got their hands on all the Martian technology and then had spaceships and ray guns and this kind of thing. And you have the kind of things that you might have seen on TV and in comics like The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And to me that is proper steampunk because you've got walk-on point, you know, walk-on parts for Queen Victoria and Sherlock Holmes and that kind of thing. And it's something I did toy with, but uh, I actually preferred having a fantasy world where you don't actually have to do that much in the way of getting your research um, totally nailed down. I must admit, when, when I was a lot younger, I did try and write a book which I abandoned, which was basically a kind of Victorian James Bond series, where you, you had the first Secret Service and a, and a character, a spy. And it was kind of influenced by the Flashman novels and that kind of thing as well. But I, I got about sort of four or five chapters into that book, and what I found was it was actually very, very hard to get all the details right. Because just the basics of, well, this guy steps out of his house and he's got to get from this point in London to that point. Did that road exist in those times? Well, I knew the railway stations were there, but were they there in 1831, or were they built in 1835? And that's the kind of thing where if you're writing those books, you're just guaranteed to get uh, hundreds and hundreds of letters in from angry uh, historical buffs saying, oh, you idiot, you know, that handsome cab didn't exist in 1834. They had the one that was painted yellow, and it didn't have gas lamps because they weren't introduced until 1846. And all those details you need to get right, whereas with a, a pure fantasy work set in the far future, you don't actually need to get those details right. Uh, obviously, you need a kind of a conceit of how you get to that point. And for me, um, one of the ideas was that you, the, the, the forces of um, sort of galactic uh, evolution of physics had actually changed so that electricity in the far, far future, and we're talking like hundreds of millions of years, actually had changed. So that uh, voltage basically became very unreliable and it was very easy for machines to get burnt out. So the sort of default technology went back to being steam or in certain cases uh, nanomechanical me nano me uh, nanotechnology based sort of machines. Um, and that got rid of a lot of the, 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 the kind of things in society which would, would look out of place in a steam driven society. So that was really my conceit for having a, a Victorian future in, in you know, the millions of years in the future. But by setting it millions of years in the future, you can also have a lot of fun with the evolution of races and that kind of thing. So there are entire subsets of mankind in my book that have kind of branched out and have become discrete little subspecies. Uh, so you've got people like the Cranobians, which have got kind of crab-like armour, and uh, creatures called lash lights, which are basically flying lizard people. And really all these uh, were either subsets of humanity who have evolved off in my book, or creatures that were actually genetically engineered at some point in, in the time. 